is still relevant how many years after. So you discover that doing well is critically important for your today and for your tomorrow and for the, for the well-being or for the kind of life that your children will live. So you can't just take it for granted. You can't just take it, you know, as well, I don't care. No. Number one, it is God's will for you to do well. Number two, doing well honors God. You know, you remember how God showed off his people when he showed off Job, for example. Have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered my servant Toyin? Have you considered my servant John? It honors God. It brings honor to God. I was a student fellowship president on campus. Right from my 100 level, I was in the exco of my, of my school fellowship. But I, I, I knew that I carried the name of heaven. And that name must never be brought to disrepute. You understand what I'm saying? So there's a name that I carry. And that's the name of God. And everywhere I go to, honor must follow that name. So when you do well, God is glorified. Because the God that we serve is an excellent God. Right? So it brings honor to God. Number three, it improves your marketability in the marketplace. By the time you eventually leave school, do your NYC and you want to start looking for a job. By the time they see your first class or your 2-1, it distinguishes you from the crowd. So don't just go to school and just go through just like that. Go to school with a passion to do well. Again, I said here that it improves your chances of getting overseas scholarship. I, I had the privilege of winning the British Chevney Scholarship in 2004. It changed my life. I got that scholarship on the platform of my performance on campus, academically. By the time I got that scholarship, the British government paid me. Paid my school fees, paid my stipend, paid for everything that I needed. Even when I was missing my wife, because I was married that time, I went to them and I told them, I said, look, I'm missing my wife, I can't concentrate. They gave me a ticket to go back to Nigeria, spend some time with my family and come back to the UK. On the platform of my performance on campus. It increases your chances of getting different kinds of jobs. All through my career, I've worked in several places. Because after working in a particular place, I felt, no, I have, I, I need something more. Then I applied. They, and they get, and, and they give me the opportunity. I've worked in Leadway Assurance. I've worked in FBM Merchant Bankers. I've worked in Platinum Bank. Got a scholarship, went abroad, came back. Went to Bank PHB, worked in Echo Bank. Worked in Owando before I got to where I am today in Chevron. But somebody who doesn't have something to sell cannot be that mobile. Because you're stuck. So you see that it helps you to do what? To have different kinds of jobs until you get to where you're going. Again, it makes witnessing easy. You know, I remember when I was on campus, I used to come up stage to preach to my classmates. You know, if you are not doing well, they'll just shout you down. Oh God, go and sit down. Oh God, we are our class. But when they know that you are top of that class and you come to the front and you begin to talk to them, guess what? Everywhere we go quiet. I, and I did that several times. So it helps you to witness to people. They know that the person talking to them already has substance. You are not just preaching because um, you are poor or because... Uh, no! They know that the person talking to them is also leading them in class. So they are more, they will be more attuned to listening to you than to listen to somebody who is struggling. Again, it attracts favor. I have a lot of scriptures for this, but the one I'll use is Dan, Daniel chapter 6 verse 3, where the Bible says, Daniel so distinguished himself, he so distinguished himself by his exceptional abilities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. When you do well, they will set you up. When you do well, you will attract favor in your place of work and everywhere. Now, what are the keys to excellence? All these things I'm talking about, they don't come cheap. They don't come by wishful thinking. They won't come to you because you are a Christian or because you are born again. There were born again on campus who had extra years 
born again, um, um, born again Christians who were withdrawn from school, withdrawn from their faculties on grounds of bad performance. But that will not be your own portion in Jesus' name. So what are the things that you need to have this excellence we are talking about? Number one, you must desire it. That's why the Bible says without vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29 verse 18. So you must have a vision for it. There must be a desire. I want to do well. I didn't go to Ife, for example, and came out as overall best student by just strolling. Uh, okay, when is lecture? Oh, it's tomorrow. Okay. Then I strolled back. No. Right from the get-go, I knew where I was headed. So the vision helped me to coordinate my activities. When other people were, 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 were gisting or loafing around, I will go to the library and be reporting cases. I will go to the library, I will be doing research. When they give us, when they give us two cases on a particular legal principle, I will go to the library and add two more. On the day of examination, other people are giving two, two, two cases to back up a legal principle. I'm giving four. As I'm giving four cases, I'm also quoting what a judge said in a case. So there is no way that they will give us the same mark. You know why I was doing that? There was a vision. I knew what I wanted. I knew where I was heading. So wherever you are, whether you're in secondary school or in the university or any other institution, have a vision of where you want to go to. And that vision must be so great that it will require the help of God for you to achieve it. Number two. Believe in yourself. No matter what your background is like, believe that you can do it. You remember what Paul said in Philippians 4.13. He said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Your background is not, should not be an excuse for failure. Oh, I came from a polygamous family. Oh, I'm the last born of my family. Oh, my, I came from a polygamous family. My father was a civil servant. My mom was a trader. I walked on the streets of Lagos. I walked bread. I walked provision. When people were on, in school, some of them were, were buying foreign authors' textbooks. Books that were written in UK. Me, the one written locally, I don't even get. But there was a passion and a vision that made a difference. So you cannot afford to use any excuse for failure. So you must believe in yourself because in truth and in deed, you can do anything through Christ that strengthens you. Number three, believe in God. The Bible says in the book of Job, the Bible says there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty gives him understanding. In Luke one thirty seven, the Bible says, with God, all things are possible. So as you have your vision, you believe in yourself, then believe in God. Because God is able to make it happen for you. Don't think that there is anything that is too difficult to achieve. If you make up your mind today that you want to leave your school with the first class, it is possible. So believe God. Number four, be diligent. Work hard. You have to read. You have to study. You have to do research. You have to participate in tutorials. Don't say you are going to fellowship when they are doing tutorials. I was a pastor. I was a student fellowship president on campus for two years. I did not miss one lecture on ground that, oh, fellowship. You, you, you cannot over-spiritualize it. Because by the time you keep doing fellowship when they are, you are supposed to be in class, you know what will happen? You will miss out on important lessons in class. And at the end of the day, other people will be doing well. You will not do well. I will be crying out to God and say, God, why is this happening to me? It is not God. It is you. Amen. So you need to work hard. You need to rebuild the spirit of laziness. When other people are sleeping, read. When other people are loafing around, enter the library. Get more points. Get more information. Get more, more instruction so that at the end of the day, when you are writing your test, everybody is giving four points, you are giving seven points, you are giving eight points. It makes a whole difference. Praise the Lord. And that's why in Proverbs 22, 29, the Bible says, Seest thou a man diligent in his business, 
He shall do what? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. The contemporary English version says, if you do your job well, you will work for a ruler and never be a slave. If you do your job well, even as a student. May the Lord help us. And that's why I said that we have, we have not come to talk about theory here. We lived it. These are the things we handled. I walked the, the streets of OAU campus. I did visitation. I did Bible study. I counseled people. I prepared for messages. I did so many things, but it was never enough as an excuse to fail. If God could do it for me, he can do much more for you. Don't, 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 don't absent yourself from class and say, I will copy the note. You know, it's not about copying notes. There are some things that the, the lecturer will say in class that if you are not there, you will miss it. And it, there are some of those things, the people you want to copy notes from will not put it down. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Number five, move with people with the right mentality for excellence. The Bible says, he that walks with the wise shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Don't be moving around with somebody who does not have the kind of passion and the vision that you have. Like minds think alike. All through my campus days, I remember before a lecture finishes, we will be there waiting for the lecturer to finish, then we enter. Then we sit in the front. I will not, you will never see me in the company of people who will sit at the back. And when the lecture is going on, somebody will just make one very funny comment and everybody will be laughing. Those were people, we used to call them NFAs, no future ambition. You will never say, I don't know them. Because I was carrying a vision. I was looking into the future. So if somebody is not serious, you will never find me in such a company. So don't say, ah, he's my friend. Oh, she's my, she's my cousin. So you just be using legs to be scattering ground all up and down. When you should be doing some very serious work. Because you are thinking about your future. You are thinking about the kingdom that you carry. Number six, pray. Pray. Job 32, 8. There's a spirit in man and the inspiration of the almighty gives him understanding. Pray for divine understanding. Pray for retentive memory. Pray for ability to recollect. Pray for divine favor. Praise the Lord. So these are a couple of things that I want you all to take on board and utilize and deploy as you go through school. Because don't forget, it is much more than the school you are in. You are actually working and studying for your future. You are working and studying for the future of your children. Because in Kotayeba Jeleema Gbefu, it is what you have that you will carry that will determine the kind of job you have in life. The Lord will help us. I mean, there are some things I can't say in public. You know, some people have said that uh, you can never be an employee and be rich. You must own your own business. And I tell them very quickly, there are jobs and there are jobs. Right? There are some places where you work, you are sorted for life. Because before you say one thing like this, you've seen millions in your account. You say another thing, you've seen another million in your account. And by the time you are prudent with what you do and you save and you plan well and you invest, generations unborn coming through your lineage will never be poor. And you are an employee. Sila. Very quickly because of my time. I know for a lot of people right now, Astro is on strike. A lot of people are at home. Nothing to do. Nothing to, you know, really, really get busy with. But let me give you a couple of things that you can begin to do. Not to while away time, but to take advantage of the time that you have. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. NIV says, make the most of every opportunity. Amplify says, making the very most of your time on earth. Recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and word and diligence. 
During the lockdown, how many courses did you take online? How many courses? How many programs? How many things did you learn free on YouTube? A lot of people run many trainings. How many of them did you take? How many of them can you replicate or can you document on your CV? All through the lockdown, guess what some people did? Some people did so many courses and so many trainings that their CVs are very rich. But many of us, we have nothing to show for the lockdown. Nothing to show for it. It was a great opportunity. So if ASU still refuses to call up the strike, what should you do? Go and look for trainings online to develop your computer skills. Learn some coding skills. Learn, uh, learn presentation skills. How do you make PowerPoint presentation? If you attend an interview and they ask you, can you, make, can you give us a presentation? You won't be looking at them as if they are talking French. You can just say them, give me five minutes. I'll put it, a PowerPoint presentation together and you deliver. Learn PowerPoint presentation. Emotional intelligence. Diversity and inclusion. Communication skill. All the Microsoft packages. Do you know how to use Microsoft Excel? Do you know how to use Microsoft Outlook? A young lady came to do an internship in a, in a friend's law firm. And when this lady came, the guy told, him, told her that, look, send me an email, blah, 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 and all that. And they opened a the Microsoft Outlook, um, whatever, for her. The lady did not know how to use it. A graduate in Nigeria in 2020. You know why? Because they spend all their time on Instagram. They spend all their time on social media. And I have nothing against social media because I use social media. I go on Instagram. But I will not go on Instagram when I have serious work on my own personal life, personal development to do. So you must learn to prioritize and give priority to things that are very important to your life. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And I pray that as we do all that, we will prepare. Somebody says success is when Opportunity meets what? Preparation. Prepare for your future. Prepare for your future. And that your future will not start when you finish school. Your future starts now. Your future does not start when you start applying to get jobs. You get to a point that what you carry, people will be headhunting you. They will be looking for you. By the time you put your, your profile on a place like LinkedIn, they will, I mean, they will be contacting you. So I want somebody to really, really make up his or her mind to have a future that is really great because it is possible. We have lived it. We have seen it. We are walking in the reality of it. Many more can join us because there is room for everybody at the top. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Shall we share a word of prayer? Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity you've given to us today. We ask, O oh King of Glory, that these few things we have shared together will make a monumental impact in the lives of everyone who is hearing. And that God, we will be propelled, we will be inspired, Lord God, to take steps that will make a difference in our lives. Father, we receive grace and enablement of the Spirit to do this. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Praise God. So, I'm going to title this piece, Positioning Yourself for the Higher Grounds. I will start by sharing a story with you. A very strong and healthy, but poor and stagnant young man, drenched in the pool of poverty, on Sunday went to church, cried unto the Lord, Rolled and rolled on the ground, casting and binding every spirit of poverty in his life. When the preacher prays, every spirit of poverty in your life is destroyed by fire. Even when this young man is asleep, he will be the first among the congregation to jump up and shout a very powerful Amen. On Monday, where is he? 
He is found in his house, laying on his precious mat, like one who is already satisfied with what life offers him. On Tuesday, he is found outside his house, enjoying the cool breeze of nature and probably waiting for his destiny helper to come and locate him where he is seated and waiting. On Wednesday, he is still at home, however, this time with his friends, sharing the problems of his life with his friends, how poverty has dealt with him mercilessly. On fast days and Fridays, he is found roaming about the streets, begging for bread from those who had sacrificed their time and ability to make ends meet for themselves. On Saturday, well, we all read that on the seventh day, God rested. So my man decided to relax his mind, catch some cruise with his friends, who gives him fish to eat. However, refused to teach him how to catch that fish. He never bothered to ask anyway. All he does is to eat the fish and then go back home to continue swimming in that pool of poverty. And then on Sunday, where is he found again? He is found in the church rolling on the ground, yet still binding and casting the spirits of poverty. A father cannot send his children to the farm without giving them the necessary equipment needed for them to successfully cultivate plant and harvest crop. A father cannot send his children to school without giving them the necessary materials needed for them to perform excellently in school. So God our Father cannot and did not create us here on earth without giving us that special gift and ability that will enable us to show forth his glory and position ourselves to that higher ground. We don't make this song declaration on a daily basis. I am a chosen generation, called for to show His excellence. All I require for life God has given me. I know who I am. And it goes on and on like that. And another part says, take a look at me, I'm a wonder. It doesn't matter what you see now. Can't you see His glory? Because I know who I am. Now hear this. Beyond the words, beyond the lyrics, Beyond the confession, beyond the declaration, beyond the cries, beyond the lamentation, the manifestation of the recalibration for the higher ground God has already set for us is backed by our hunger, by our desire, by our deliberate action to show forth the glory, to show forth the wonder, to show forth the power to show forth the victory, to show forth the light of him that dwells richly in us. This is not a time to slumber. This is not a time to be weary. This is a call to action. This is a call to the awakening of the zeal and spirit to begin to take a step to position yourself to that higher ground. We, we make this positive declaration on a daily basis. But are we end by asking you this question? Are you ready to take the necessary step needed for you to position yourself to that higher ground God has already set for you? I leave you to ponder on that. Thank you very much. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to once again welcome everyone to this Next Gen Summit 2020. And I want to thank the Lord for all the various speakers that the Lord has been using for us at this conference. Uh, we have had some of our ministers and some will still be coming 
after now to minister to us today and also tomorrow. Uh, this afternoon, very quickly, I'm going to be talking on the topic, recalibrating in Korea. Uh, the focus of the Next Gen Summit this year is actually to encourage our young people to recalibrate in every sphere of life, looking into their spiritual, in their ministry life, looking in the area of their heads, uh, looking in the area of the academic, academics, and also in the area of career. So this afternoon, I'm going to be talking on recalibrating in career. And I'm going to be taking my anchor test from the book of Second Kings, chapter 7. Second Kings, chapter 7. I will be reading verses 3, 4, and 5. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for bringing us together. Lord, as we go into your word and as we are going to be encouraging ourselves through your word, Lord, I pray that you will teach us. Lead us, O oh Lord, and let your blessing be released upon us. After this 2020 convention, all our young people shall get to the point of their higher ground and to their destinies. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to be reading the scripture, Second Kings chapter 7. I read 3 to 5. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit, stay here, we will die also. Now, therefore, come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Verse 5. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost parts of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. I'd like to start to encourage somebody this afternoon. Now, there are times we are afraid of taking steps in life. Not knowing that what we are afraid of is actually not existing. And that was exactly the story of these four leprous men. The Bible said they were afraid. But the good part of it, at a point in their journey, they made up their mind to go and confront the host of Syria, not even knowing that there is no one or there was no one there. And that is going to be the focus of my talk to us this afternoon, recalibrating in career. Many of us would have done great and mighty things in life. But because of the fear of unknown, because we don't know what the future holds, we stay back from moving forward. We cannot take a step. And that's why I'm going to be looking at the topic, career, and how do we sit back and recalibrate ourselves in the area of career. So the first thing I'm going to be talking about is to look at the definition of the word career. Career, we can define it as an occupation. That suddenly, maybe or the occupation that somebody undertakes for a significant period in the person's life and with opportunities for progress. I take that again. Career is an occupation undertaken for a significant period of a person's life and with opportunities for progress. Number one thing you must understand is career is not something you can do for a whole time you are going to spend in this world. But your career is something that takes a good percentage. That's why their definition says for a significant period of a person's life and with opportunity to progress. So if you are doing something and there is no opportunity to progress in that particular endeavor, that it may not be a career that God has assigned for you. Let me quickly ask. There are times you look at yourself and you want to ask some questions. And you think, 
How, how did I get to this point where I am? Maybe you have gotten to that point where you are frustrated. And suddenly, every tried and tested way of walking and the way you think, everything seems not giving you any hope or future or any results. And the question is, how did I meet myself at this point? Or maybe what you do now, you are finding it difficult to actually make any progress in it. And you are feeling out that, look, I just have to throw in the towel. I just have to get out of what I'm doing. Maybe this is not my calling. Maybe this is not what the Lord wants me to do. Or maybe you are feeling that everyone around you, nobody is supporting what you are doing and you have gotten to a point of pushing blame on yourself. Because what you are doing, you are not seeing the results. And that is what will be leading us to this topic this afternoon. How do I recalibrate myself? How do I reorganize myself? How do I put myself through, even in the area of career? And let me start to say that if you are listening to me and you are yet to start something, you know, we cannot recalibrate when you have not actually started to do something. So the first thing is to take a step. And that step will be to find your hand to do something. Find something to do. If maybe you are confused as per what do I do in life, I will say, one, go to God and pray. Let the Lord lead you. Number two, find the area of your strength. Look at what interests you. Look at what you can do freely. Even when nobody's giving you money, that thing may be a sign to where the Lord is taking you to. And I want to define the word calibration. I say recalibration means taking time to step back. You may need to withdraw a little at a given time to reflect and determine exactly who you are right now and what will make you happier than you are now and how you can actively lead yourself effectively to achieve more of what you want and love in your career in life. So when you get to that point of recalibration, you want to actually check you want to remeasure, you want to sit back and wait. What I have been doing, is it actually giving me any results? Am I progressing? Is it making me happy? And we're going to be looking very quickly. What are the several reasons why I need to actually recalibrate in the area of my career? Why do I need to check what I'm doing now if that is what the law wants me to do? How do I check? Maybe this thing is actually giving me enough joy in what I'm doing now. Number one of the reasons why you need to recalibrate in the area of your career. And before I go to the reasons, as you like to take that step of recalibration, the first thing you need to work upon or work on is your POS. I call it personal operating system. Every man has this mind in him that wants to get better in whatever he's doing. And I want to believe as you are listening to me, you want to get better in that endeavor. Maybe you are being paid as a salary staff, or maybe you have started something that you are doing, or you are under unemployment, or even it's an NGO that you are working with. The satisfaction in the art of every man is to get better in that thing that you do, and to create a kind of joy that this thing I am doing, I am happy in doing it. Now, how do I recalibrate, and why do I need to recalibrate? Number one reason why we need to recalibrate we must shine light on our priorities. If we have not determined what our priorities are, it may be difficult for us to grow in a particular career. That's why you see some people today, they enter into a particular career, and by tomorrow, as them, they have changed again. They have not sat back to actually identify what their priorities are. The first thing you need to do is to identify what has God wired you with? What are the potentials that you carry? And immediately you understand this, then you can take the first step, and that is shining light on these priorities. Number two, you need to have a clarity on your career path. It is not every job that you can do. And that you have studied something in the institution or in the school does not mean that must be the end of your career path. You can actually study a particular course, 
At times, you study a particular cause and God may want to use it to network you. We are going to be talking about networking as we go. But what we are talking about is uh, that you have studied a particular cause. At times, it could be an indication. At times, it may not actually be. It may be that God just wanted you to have that experience and that idea and to have people that you have schooled together. But look at what gives you joy. Look at what makes you happy. Look at what you can say, this, whenever I do it, I think I can progress in this. Don't forget the definition I gave to us on career. Any career that is not going to give you joy or satisfaction, there may be a need to sit back and recalibrate. We will get back to what do I do when I find myself in that kind of career. So, and that career also must have opportunities to progress. Point number three. How or why do I need to recalibrate? I need to recalibrate because I need to refocus my energy on a particular thing that I am doing. Many people today are doing some things because they just need to step off their, out of their houses. Some are doing it just because anything you can pay me, just pay me. This talk is for you if you are in that category. You know why? Whatever you are doing that is not out of joy, that you don't, maybe you wake up on a Monday morning and you pray, oh God, Monday has come again. Why not just, it's another weekend for me to relax at home and, and rest. Whatever you do that does not give you satisfaction, whatever you do that will not give you a way to move forward in life, then you need to sit back and refocus your energy. What is that thing that will give us the joy that we actually want. Point number four, reasons why we need to recalibrate. We need to recalibrate because we need to kill off every negative whispers. There are discouragers, there are people around, there are things that will come our way. In fact, there are some things that will even be God's will for you to do. But if you don't recalibrate at a given point, at a time, you may think that this thing I am doing because I am facing challenges there, then maybe that is not the will of God for my life. Listen, many of us that we've started one career or the other, and today we own or we run our businesses. We have gotten to that point even when we first started the business. That maybe in the first two years or in the first few years of starting the business, you will get to that point and you begin to ask yourself, is this business actually the will of God for me? It's like when you go into marriage and you begin to question yourself. Oh, this partner, I didn't know he would do like this. I didn't expect this. The same thing happened in the area of career or business that we do. But when this happens, what do we do? Kick off all the negative whispers. And point number five, from that point where you are kicking off the negativities, what do you now do? You identify the opportunity for growth. That's point number five. So the, one of the reasons why we need to sit back and recalibrate is to be able to identify what opportunity is there for me. Maybe I'm working today as an engineer or I'm working as a teacher. As a teacher in a school where I've been teaching under a proprietor or a proprietress, I can actually sit and recalibrate what opportunities are ahead of me. If I do this job, this work I'm doing faithfully, is it possible for me in the nearest future that I can also start my own school? Is it possible for me that I can, from this business, start my own business? If I will share a personal experience with you, my listener, I remember when I was in one of the places I work in my journey. Um, my first four or five years there, I had reasons why I would have left. But one thing that kept me there was I wanted and I needed to learn everything about how to run a business. So the Lord kept telling me, until you have learned all you need to learn, so that by the time you get out there, then you can do it in a better way than what you are seeing here. There are times that maybe as if the journey is slow. And I'm encouraging somebody this afternoon that you meet opposition in that career, that there are challenges in what you are doing. It does not mean all the time that God is not asking you to do it. 
But when that happens, what do you need to do? You need to sit back and recalibrate. And recalibrating is asking yourself and asking God if you need to go and seek the face of God. Lord, this assignment, this career that I find myself, what are you saying that I should do next? I want to encourage you. Don't leave it until you have heard from God. God will always speak. Whatever you are doing today, identify there must be an opportunity for growth. Point number six. When you recalibrate, it allows you to be influenced and impacted by others. At that point, you begin to see people who can be of blessing, who can be of interest to where you are getting to. And God will begin to network you with people. And that is one of the reasons why we need to sit back and recalibrate. Do you know another thing that recalibration does to us? It helps us to recognize, that's the seventh point, it helps us to recognize a dead-end job. What do I mean by dead-end job? These are kind of job that when you find yourself in it, it's as if you don't even know what is happening again. You are stagnant. You are at a point. You are just tired of this job. But the only reason why you are there is because you have no other place to go. The only reason why you still find yourself there is because I know you have already sent out your uh, application. Your CV has gone everywhere. But you still come to that same office. You still attain that assignment. Why? Because you just have to leave the house in the morning. You just have to go out and walk. But inside of you, there is no joy. You are not happy with what you are doing. That kind of job is called a dead-end job. Your love is gone doing the kind of the job. Opportunity is like not coming forth and you are out of being relevant even to the job. There are times you work in an organization and you meet yourself in that kind of situation. What do you do? Ask yourself this question. Maybe when I wake up in the morning, how do I feel when I want to go to work? Do I feel like I need to go to that work? Do I feel happy when I'm going to that work? What are we talking about? These are things you do when you are recalibrating. And as you are recalibrating, and you notice that the joy of going to do the work is gone, how will you say, number one, go back to God. Let God tell you what to do. And when you have spoken to God, then take a step. Do not continue to sit back. Look at those four lepers. The Bible made us to understand in the book of 2 Kings chapter 7, 3 to 5. These men, they were already outside the city. Where they were, they were in a place where they were not comfortable. They were in a place where hunger and everything was biting them. But they needed to take a step. And uh, the story of these four lepers have always encouraged me. Do you know why? As a young man, as a young woman, there are times we need to move on in life. But we got to a point where fear will begin to deal with us. We don't know if I leave this job now, what will happen next. But the question I ask when we get to that kind of situation is this. If you fail to leave the job because you don't know what will happen next, what about if the employer asks you to go? If the employer sack you, what will you do? Will you go and die? No. So if you have prayed about it, and you know that you are having that leading to leave that job, to seek for another job. You know this job you are doing is not giving you the kind of joy you want. It's not making you to be happy. You feel burdened anytime you want to go to work. And it's like you are carrying a big load upon yourself. You have reached that point where we call it a dead end job. Then what do you do? Pray to God. And after you have prayed to God, do what? Take a step. Don't just sit back and say, well, what I will do now is to be praying. Once I pray, God will bring jobs someday, one day, somewhere. You need to take a step. Now, how do I know that I am taking the next step in my career? We need to observe the following. The moment you have done your recalibration. The moment you have looked at your career and you want to check, am I really moving forward? Look at these seven points. Number one, growth is essential. Am I growing in that business? Am I growing in that office? Am I growing in this thing that I am doing? Or have I just been like a stagnant water? I must be ready to take a step. That is what that point number one is talking about. If I notice I am not growing, 
If all I am doing is just for doing sake, then there is an issue. And that's why this afternoon we have gathered together, either online or you listening to me where you are, that we need to go back and recalibrate in our career. So as we are recalibrating, we're going to be checking, am I growing or am I just there? Am I just marking time? There are several ways in which you can grow. Number two, building a network of people for a network. When you are in that career, listening to this, not every career may give you your desired money. And let me also say this. Money is not the result of career growth. The greatest thing in career growth is satisfaction. Do you find satisfaction in what you do? Do you find joy in what you do? Once that is there, then you are okay. But when the uh, joy is not there, then there's a problem. So God could also keep you in that work so that you can build a network of people for a network. Do not be alone. Relate with people. So we are talking about the indicators. What do I watch out for? If I'm in a career, how do I check if I've done my recalibration? Number one, we talk about growth. There must be step-by-step -step growth in what I am doing. And if I notice there is no growth, then I need to recalibrate and check. This thing I'm doing, is it what the Lord will want me to do? <clears throat> Number two, we've talked about building a network of people. When we build network with people, it brings us network. There are people you will meet in this journey where you are working today. They may not be too nice to you today, but in the nearest future, God will actually bring them back your way. I've had that experience in my work in life. Where I work in some time past, we met some people, we were there together as co-staff, co-worker, but it got to a time after we have all left that particular organization and we begin to network ourselves. So God may also keep you there. So while you are in a particular place, like I said, if salary is not growing, you can also check, am I building people? Am I having network? Am I really having people that I'm growing with? People that can help my destiny in the nearest future. Point number three, taking every opportunity. We must be ready to take risk. One of the challenges in life where we remain stagnant and we are not moving forward in our career is because we just want to do it the way we've been doing it, following the status quo. We must get to a point where we will say, no, let me take a risk. You know, in the business world, we call it a risk. But in Christendom, we call it faith. Just like those four lepers that we spoke about, they took a great risk to live where they were. Ordinarily, they were not supposed to go into the city, but they left where they were and they moved to the next step. I want to encourage somebody listening to me. When you think you are not moving forward in that career where you are, take a step. And what is that step? Look at the next available opportunity. Look at what step you need to take. It may be very challenging. You may look at it, ah, I need to spend money. How will the money come? I will say, take a step first. Don't wait for money first. Somebody said, idea rules the world. It's not the money that will take that step for you. But when you have taken step, I know the story of some businessmen in this nation today. They actually started when they had nothing. I know of a particular business in this Nigeria that has gone everywhere in Nigeria today. When the man started it, he had no money. But God gave him the inspiration. God gave him the idea. And he went about telling people, sharing his plan with people. Brother, you can do the same. My sister, you can also do the same. First thing you need is get an idea of what the Lord will want you to do. And take a step to move forward. Point number four, be zealous of good work. We must be solution driven. If you are working anywhere and you are not bringing solution to that particular place, you may need to go back and recalibrate. Wherever we are as children of God, we are to be solution driven anywhere we go. 
So your life must bring opportunity and solution to that environment where you are. If you need to pray about it, pray about it. If you need to read more, read more. If you need to go and do research, you need to research into some things that you need to do. Our life must be solution-driven. This is part of what recalibration will do for us. Point number five. Set your mind on excellence. Do not work with mediocres. You must prepare your mind that whatever I want to do, I must go for excellence. It's not just anyhow. And it starts from now. Maybe you are still working under somebody. Or maybe you are an employee or you are a staff in an organization. Don't say because well, I've, I've had this and I've seen it happening. Some junior workers will say, well, let me just do it anyhow. You know why? I'm still going to pass it to my boss. When my boss collects it, he's going to proofread and check and correct it. That is not the good spirit of a career person or a believer. Whatever you are doing as a young man, as a young lady, what you will do is you do not want anybody to find error in whatever is coming from your table. And that is how to be excellent. Do not think that where well, it will go to the next table and the next table will correct it. Let's always find opportunity to be the best wherever we are. I go to point number six. Always review your performance against your set goals. If you do not have set goals, there is nothing you can reveal. As a young man, as a young lady, whatever you are doing, you must have targets. In your spiritual life, in your study, in your career, you must be able to look at it from the beginning of the year. What do I want to achieve by the end of this year? You will not cascade it into a quarter. Every three, three months, what do I want to achieve? You should be able to plan in the next three years, where am I going? In the next five years, where will I be? As we are doing this, it will not help us by the time we want to recalibrate. We can check what is my performance vis a vis my set goals. And that is why point number six says, always review performance against set goals. Have referees to check. Many of us, we are just on our own. Nobody is checking what we are doing, and we are so happy with that. It is not a good ethic. As a business owner, one of the things we do is we appoint board of directors. Why do we appoint this board of directors? They will be there looking at the business from outside. They will be there to be checking our lapses. They will be there to correct whatever we are doing and we are not doing well. And I want to encourage a young person listening to me this afternoon. If you are working somewhere and you don't want people to correct you, listen, you may not get to the next level. A man that will go to the next level, that will get to the higher ground that we are talking about, must be a man that has been pruned by different kind of superiors, by different kind of bosses, by different kind of people. And that's why, you know, when you go to football, you have referees checking how the goal is going, how somebody is playing. And that is exactly the way it must be. Every career man or woman must have a referee. What is the work of this referee? A referee is the person that check you. This, are you doing it well? Is there an area you need to improve? Is there an area you need to be encouraged? Is there something you need? So that is on point number six. Always review performance against set goals. And the last one that we must do as we recalibrate, we must always ask questions and challenge ourselves. Ask yourself question. How am I doing it? Am I doing it well? Even before the referee we talk, you can go to your neighbor, you can go to your friends, you can go to people benefiting under your service and ask them. That's why in the business world we have what we call questionnaire. What do we do? We send out questionnaire to our customers. We say, fill this questionnaire. Let me know how I am performing, how I am doing. I want to encourage us today. How do we improve in our career? We need to sit back and check our performance, review our performance as against our set goal and ask questions as we go ahead. Maybe you are here or you are listening to me and you have been facing challenges in your career. 
Number one thing I'd like to tell you this afternoon as I begin to close this talk is, one, identify the place of God. God is the maker. God is the one that has sent you into this world. You did not come on your own. Take instruction from God. That's one thing the Lord has taught me to do. Don't jump into anything without God letting you or telling you or directing you to go into it. And listen again. The moment you have prayed, check what is that thing that interests you. What is that thing that gives you joy? What is that thing that you do conveniently? Go into it. It may not be giving you money immediately, but when you take a step, over time, you'll begin to reap it. And there are things that are challenging you. Take a step of faith. Take a risk and move forward. I pray for you this afternoon. The grace to move forward in your career and to get to the peak of your destiny. The Lord will grant you that grace in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for this word that we have shared. I pray for every listener this afternoon. The grace to move forward as we recalibrate our career. Lord, grant us that grace. Lord, the higher ground that you have promised us, we will get there in our businesses, in our employment, in our services, and in all that we do. Glory be to the name of the Lord. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. You're welcome to this next Gen Summit 2020. And um, welcome everyone. Thank you for the lovely ambience and uh, the invitation. God bless you all in Jesus' name. Our broad theme for this summit is higher ground. And uh, the sub-theme for this next-gen summit is uh, recalibration for higher ground. And I will be talking on recalibration in marriage. Recalibration in marriage. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you, Lord, very, for very, this very, very beautiful, glorious day that you have made we thank you, King of Glory, very much for this auspicious moment. We pray that as we look into your words to share a few wisdom from your words this day, I pray in the name of Jesus that your word will be correctly divided in the name of Jesus. I pray as we divide the word of truth, each and every one of us, the hearer and the speaker, will learn. And we pray that our lives will be better as we make use of the wisdom tips you are giving unto us at this moment in Jesus' name. Father, thank you. Amen and amen. Recalibration in marriage. Now, just meditating over the word recalibration. Before the word re, there was calibration. And looking forward, the word calibration is important for us, you know, to know what calibration is. Because it helps us to know why the need for recalibration. Calibration is important because it helps us to assume and to be sure of the accurate measurement. And accurate measurement are requirement very, very much required for most research. I'm an educationist, so I know the meaning of standards. Now, in, uh, uh, in talking about calibration, we are talking about the acceptable measurement. We are talking about the acceptable, the optimal, you know, functioning capacity of a particular equipment such that if anything tampers with that standard, something will go wrong. If we use an automobile, for example, the optimal calibration is such that, that we make the vehicle to perform optimally such that it will not endanger the life of the drivers or other, you know, 
users of the road at any particular point in time. I call calibration, I call it actually the default setting. When a manufacturer, let's use a, a, a Android for example, you know, the way it has been set by the manufacturer, when anything goes wrong, you know, when the standard has changed, there will be malfunctioning. So the world recalibration, I want to believe that the, our youth, they've actually, you know, thought about, you know, a world that, you know, can actually capture, you know, your attention. And now, in marriage, marriage, there is a particular standard for godly marriage. I want to use uh, our theme, you know, to explain something in my introduction. I want to use our, uh, our, our theme. I want to use it quickly to explain. Now, if we look at the background, we'll realize the, the design being used. Different, uh, we have about five mountains being projected. And out of the five, one of the mountains, one of the mountains, the is higher, taller, the highest among the five. 